Let me start with a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Okay, great. So tonight we'll talk about the natural law. And we can distinguish between the concept of the natural law as such, like what do we mean by that, and the content, what does it contain. And we can start with the concept. Uh, This is a little bit abstract, theoretical, but I think it's important to get the concept um, in order to understand that the content is not arbitrary, that the content gains a certain power and authority um, and also relatability and and communicability to others when we understand what we mean by natural law in general from the concept of natural law. So what do we mean by natural law? Well, there we can distinguish between laws of nature and the natural moral law. And these two concepts are related. Laws of nature and the natural moral law. So in order to get at this, let's start with the word natural because we're talking about natural law, so it's good to define your terms, right? What do we mean by calling something anything, really, natural? Well, one distinction that's helpful as a way into this topic is to distinguish it from the artificial. The natural versus the artificial. And so the artificial and any artifact is the result of human technology, of human production, of human creativity, or some human skill. In contrast with the artificial, the natural is the way things are found just to be out there, right, without our intervention. The things that, relative to our power at least, just happen to exist and are the way they are. And so as opposed to the artificial, the natural is what just is outside of our activity. Whereas the artificial, by by contrast, is the result of our activity. The etymology for natural, I think, is helpful here. The etymology comes from things being born. And so natural things are things that are born or that come out of the earth. And so the same root for nature, we have natal and um, native. And so native species are species that are just found in a certain part of the world. And nativity, right, and natal have to do with giving birth. And that helps us, again, contrast it with the artificial. And so what is the artificial? The artificial takes what's found in nature, the natural, and through human ingenuity and human skill and human effort, changes it in some way. It gives it a new way of being that it didn't have just when it was found. And so we take metal and we turn it into phones, right? And we, and we take uh, chemicals that are in things, we turn them into plastics, right? Um, yeah, so all of that. Our world is very artificial. It's kind of interesting. So it's very helpful to go out in the woods and be with less artifacts, just to get a sense of nature, right, uh, what we're talking about. So that's, that's a helpful, I think, distinction. Uh, it's just the way things are and outside of our influence or outside of our activity. The, na- the, the second um, way into understanding what is natural is that n- the word nature is more or less equivalent with the word essence. And essence is not a... Um, olfactory product. 
in this in this um, you know essence of cheese um, in this context rather essence is a thing's nature right or the basic the basic way of being and acting a thing has just by being what it is right so the things that exist aren't random right they have basic ways of being and acting which make them be the kinds of things that they are and so, for example, we could agree that something like trees have a certain identifiable way of being, and that identifiable way of being would be their essence, or their essence would account for that. For instance, a tree has a certain physical construction, it has an organization of parts, those parts have different functions which serve the activity or the life of the tree as a whole. And so you can think of the roots, right, the trunk, the branches, the wood of the trunk, the leaves, depending on the type of tree, the flowers, the nuts, the fruit, and the seeds. And even though it's got all these different parts, right, they're all on the same page. They come together as a unity in the tree. Or better said, the unity that is the tree, the being of the tree, makes sense out of all the parts and accounts for why the parts aren't just randomly doing their thing, right? There's a wholeness there. And so in the traditional understanding of this, nature is essence, Nature is essence conceived of as a principle, and by principle here we mean like source, right? As a principle or source of a thing's proper activities. And this really helps with um, our kind of, this really helps with understanding where our normal way of speaking about what's natural comes from. Or it helps us understand what we mean when we say that some behavior, especially activity, is natural. So, for instance, we say it's natural for a tree to have roots. It's natural for those roots to seek water. It's natural for the trunk of a tree to lengthen for the branches and leaves to have ex more exposure to the sun. It's natural for the leaves to sprout in the spring and to fall in the autumn. It's natural for fruit to grow and that fruit to drop, right? So when we say it's natural for those activities to happen, what we're saying is that those are activities proper to a thing, which are the result of the way of being that the thing enjoys or has or is. Okay? So far, so good? Mm -hmm. All right. I know this is like, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but the, there it is. I don't know what the essence of this class is yet. <laughs> Another helpful idea here is that, okay, so natural activity follows from the nature of the essence of the thing conceived of as the identifiable unity of the thing that makes the thing be the kind of being that it is. And so when we talk about natural activity, Aristotle had a rule of thumb. He said, what is natural is what is hap what is natural is what happens always or for the most part. And so if something's natural, it's not that there's no exceptions. But it happens either always <coughs> or for the most part. Why? Because it comes from the very essence of, of the being of the things. Now, if it doesn't happen, right, if something that's natural to a thing doesn't turn out, well, that means that something went wrong, right? Something got in the way. It could be the material conditions of the thing or some interference from, for some other, from some other thing that's acting upon it. But the thing itself tends to express itself according to its proper activities. Okay, so that's natural. That's a discussion of the word natural. Um, it's natural for us to talk about this as rational beings. What about law? A very classical and I think um, very helpful definition of law is given to us by St. Thomas Aquinas. He defines law as an ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has care of the community, and promulgated. 
an ordinance of reason ordinance of reason for the common good made by him her who has care of the community and promulgated so this is easiest to understand this is easiest to understand when we're talking about properly speaking human laws and so since human beings live in society and since as we'll get to later we don't work by instinct there are certain rules we have to just decide upon in order to foster the common good so for instance the typical example is are we going to drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road well whoever has care of the community gets to decide that in a law now that might be based on tr the tradition of the area or whatever but eventually it's codified in the law so that everyone could be on the same page because it would be very severely against the common good if some people just decided to drive on the left side of the road instead of the right side under their own under their own discretion right or choice and it has to be promulgated and so laws have to be legislated and those those legislated laws have to be available for the people to know that said ignorance is rarely ever an excuse in a court of law so you're supposed to know the law all right so that's um that's the definition of law now when we apply it to when we apply it to laws of nature and then later to the more specific natural law that we call the natural moral law what's going on here or how do we understand this well first of all what's an ordinance or an ordinance is basically a command a rule that's an important word we'll, we'll use that word rule a lot a command a rule or an edict of reason so it has to be rational it has to make sense it has to be intelligible for the common good laws are not rules for individuals we talk about we were talking about the nature of a tree and so we say if it's a law a natural law for a tree that it sprouts its leaves in the spring and those leaves fall in the autumn well that's not going to apply to just one tree or it's going to apply to the whole community of trees and those laws because trees exist in a network of beings which include squirrels and uh people who like oranges that come off the trees and grass that gets fertilized perhaps by the fruit that falls and decomposes when right um that law is not just for the community of trees right um but for the community at large and so laws always have uh laws or rules always have a reference to more than just one being Right? because essences or natures except in the case of like angels govern more than just one being and those essences or natures take into account the other beings that a being might be interdependent with or um, in contact with and so it's very beautiful that like the nature of one thing in a certain sense provides for the needs of the nature of another thing and so cows eat grass right and humans make cheese from from the cow's milk or eat steaks even better okay so we uh ordinance rule of reason it's got to have a purpose it's got to be intelligible for the common good not for an individual made by him who has care of the community that means the 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 person or the body or the being that's responsible for the for the community the authority this is basically the, the the rightful authority and in the case of nature that's god i won't we'll get into this but it's hard to explain the order in nature and how things follow rules without themselves knowing what they're doing 
without God. It's one of the basic proofs for God's existence. In St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, it's the fifth way of proving God's existence in the first part of the Summa Theologiae. Okay. Promulgated, which means it has to be issued. Now, here's that's interesting when, we, when we're talking about laws of nature. Where are they promulgated or how are they promulgated? Well, first of all, to get at that, I think we can ask ourselves, what kind of laws or rules are we talking about? Here's an example, right? Animals eat in order to survive. Life is a good for animals. Food is necessary for life. And so animals tend to eat. But that's a law of nature. It happens always or for the most part. And if it doesn't happen, the animal is either dying or very sick or too scared to eat because the master's there with a stick saying, not yet, not yet, right? And so the fear will keep the animal from actually eating, even if it's hungry. Or even more um, basic, the, the, the law of gravity, right? Every mass attracts every other mass. Where are these promulgated? Well, they're promulgated in the thing itself, or in the nature of the thing itself. And so we have to distinguish here between how different kinds of beings follow laws. And so we have inanimate beings. Inanimate. And then we can we have sentient beings. And in between, we kind of have plants. <laughs> uh, and then we have rational beings. And so if something is not an animal or a plant, and plants are quasi-sensient, it's very interesting. Um, the law is promulgated, it, promulgated for it simply in its tendency to act in a certain way. It's in the nature of the, of the type of matter as such. So, for example, uh, the expansion of gas, right? The volume of gas will increase if the pressure increases. The volume of gas will increase if the temperature increases. One that I always found tautological, the volume of gas will increase if the amount of gas increases. I don't know why they had to prove that. It seems like, I don't know. Anyway, I don't know. maybe it's, it's probably deeper than I think or more complicated. I'm sure it is. Um, so what, so what does that mean? Uh, why is that in the thing and not just a description of what tends to happen? Well, because before you heat it, right, before you heat it, the gas has the potential to expand in volume even when it's at a lower volume. You're not adding more gas in that case. Or well, before you increase the pressure, the gas has the potential or kind of wants to increase Given that the impre the, given that the pressure uh, increases, and so that's a promulgation of a law that is simply in the material thing as the kind of material thing that it is, and the material thing doesn't have a senses, it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have consciousness, and so it just does that by being what it is because of its essence or nature. Now. An animal's different. In a certain sense, a dog knows that he's hungry. He feels hunger, and he has an instinct, therefore, to look, look for food, right? He's naturally equipped with an instinct which helps him follow the law that says animals eat to survive. Now, we're, we're um, more complicated than that. We don't have merely physical laws because of our nature, nor instincts merely because we're like animals, but we have reason. And so, the, so what we call the natural law when we're talking about ethics, and this is a class on Christian ethics, in case you forgot, is, um, has to do with knowing things. And so it's promulgated 
in us, not through instinct, nor through merely physical potential or physical tendency, is promulgated in us through knowledge and thought, and therefore also freedom. Any questions? No, it's all crystal clear. Clear as mud. <laughs> all right. Um, so one more. Okay, so that's the definition of law <coughs> following upon the uh, discussion of what's natural and kind of how the law is promulgated. And we'll develop the promulgation and reason when we talk about the natural uh, the natural moral law. There's only one more consideration before we move into the natural laws, the natural moral law as such. Yes, question. Well, maybe you'll address this, but someone who doesn't believe in God, how do they make sense of this without, they, do they acknowledge that the essence of something that's found in nature, do they acknowledge? They can, this? yeah. So, so there's different, um, yeah, so some people like, well, how do I explain this? I think that you can know, here's a, here's a good distinction from Aquinas. You can know that something is without knowing fully why it is. And so, yeah, someone who doesn't believe in God or creation can have all sorts of insights on the that level. They can agree that okay. trees have an essence and therefore trees act in this way and um, gases have an essence and therefore that's why they act in that way. They can agree with the order and regularity that they see and they can attribute that to the way of being of the thing. But I think where their explanation will fail is explaining the causes necessary to ultimately account for that kind of thing. Where does that nature come from? How can a thing have a goal that it's not aware of and move to it so regularly? And so for a theist, that's, you know, for different reasons, that presupposes a creator who gave the thing its end and gave the thing its nature. Yeah. Okay. The same thing with morality, right? Like Dostoevsky will say, if God doesn't exist, nothing is permissible. That's true, but it's only it's only true if you think through to its consequences. It's only true if you think through that the natural law needs a promulgator of the law. If you don't think that, you might just think, no, I can just feel this way about goodness and, and I can still be good. Or come up with some other source. Now, that would, you might have a false account, but it might be good enough for you still to believe in, in moral law. The problem with people, though, is that they're not, they're kind of clever. And so they tend to think things through to the, to the ultimate. And then if they don't have a good counter answer, well, then everything goes crazy like we have today. <sighs> okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, like, you know, noble myths don't really work. Right? You actually need good reasons if you're going to really believe something and teach it to others. One more, um, one more idea here that's connected with what we've been talking about. That's the idea of what's called teleology or finality. This is expressed by the, by the adage, all things act for an end or a goal. All things act for an end, or we could say a goal. Again, that goal might be conscious to it or not. Now, this very interesting relates to what modern, you know, modern science as we understand it, modern theoretical science does. And so when modern theoretical science discovers a law, what they're doing is they're, articul they're articulating 
the regularity of the activity and properties of material things. And so laws like, you know, E equals mc squared or force equals mass times acceleration, right, from Newtonian physics, from, from uh, Einstein. Well, the, the Thomistic argument and the argument from Aristotelian philosophy of science and philosophy of nature is that there would be no such regularity in the action of things that you can observe and measure and come up with formulas to describe, right, the regularity and the predictability of these interactions according to equations, unless the things themselves have a tendency to act in a certain way, right, unless they're acting for ends, a regular state or outcome under certain conditions. Philosophers of, sciences, philosophers of science and scientists themselves are coming to understand that a big lacuna in our understanding of modern science was the elimination of teleology from explanations. Because they saw teleology, things acting for ends outside themselves, as too closely related to religious argumentation right, or religious theological thinking. And so this is a whole other, we can have a whole other lecture on this, on what happened to science um, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries and how it leads to kind of what we have today. And so like the law of gravity, right? The goal of something moved by gravity is to move towards the thing of greater mass until it reaches a certain stability. The goal of the animal seeking food is to eat for nutrition, all right, and this happens either um, just because of the physical nature or because of the physical nature prompted by instinct or, in our case, because of knowledge, because we know what we're after. All right, so for Aquinas, what is the natural law in terms of what we call natural law when we talk about ethics? I hope I kind of related it a little bit to the laws of nature as such, so it's not just like the world and being over here, and then human nature and human experience over here, right? They're kind of like, they're all part of God's plan. They have deep, um, deep similarities and consonances. Aquinas will say that, that um, the natural law is man's, or human beings, as we would say these days, our, is that gender neutral enough? Our... our human <laughs> participation <laughs> in the eternal law. So it's our, it's our rational sharing in a law that exists in God. What is the eternal law? The eternal law is the law by which God governs the universe, including all those natural, all those laws of nature that we talked about, the laws that, that, you know, we, by which we can describe the activity of trees or squirrels or gases or uh, elementary particles. It's all those laws which, which describe and in a certain sense cause the regularity of the order of the natural universe, the created universe, as existing in God. And so our participation in it is what we call natural, moral law. I'm adding moral just to distinguish it from laws of nature in terms of like laws of physical and non-rational beings. Where is this promulgated? Well, according to scripture, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's written in the heart, right? Which really means it's, pro it's promulgated naturally. It's naturally promulgated just because we are the kinds of things we are with the, with the tendencies that we have as human beings. Just like a squirrel has tendencies, a tree has tendencies, gases have tendencies. We have natural tendencies to seek certain ends that are, that are good for us. It's promulgated naturally 
in reason or in our in our ability to know. To know and think. Of course, the fact that I quoted um, scripture to make this point, you can make this point without scripture, but the fact that I quoted scripture to make this point shows us that it's also promulgated in scripture. And so St. Thomas Aquinas um, very interestingly says that the Ten Commandments are a, are a kind of summary of the natural law. So we tend to kind of distinguish between natural ethics and theological ethics. But um, because of original sin, it's hard for us to know all the precepts of the natural law clearly enough and well enough to be saved or to be virtuous without God telling us, right? God had to come down and tell us, oh, you know, you can know this on your own, but you probably won't or you won't know all of it. So don't kill right? <laughs> or don't steal. Right? He had to re- God had to reinforce the natural law in revelation in order to help us be saved. And so that's kind of interesting, right? Because there are things that we can know, in principle we could know just by the light of reason, with our experience, with our natural ability to know the truth about the goods that we're seeking. And yet, nevertheless, God reveals it to make it easier for us and to, to, to have more clarity on, on, these, uh, on these important truths. Okay, now we're going to get really deep. We can do it. Any questions so far? Does this make some sense? If you say it was written in the the heart, could it be possible that a person can go through through his whole life, his or her whole life, without invoking that, I mean, without even knowing for for, for, for a fact (coughs) that exists? No. um, uh, Could a person go their whole life without knowing anything about morality at all? (laughs) Excuse me. No. Impossible. Right. By themselves on an island, even then. No, even then. Yeah, even then. Yeah, the point is that okay. So every tree grows. Every human being has a tendency towards certain ends, and also knowledge of that tendency, and that's a moral fact. We're we're essentially moral beings. Now the content, like how much you know, and. Uh, and um, whether you could, how does, how does it work? Yeah, the content and the certainty of the knowledge can really vary. And there's debates about this. It's like, so Thomas says everyone knows the first precepts of the natural law, but not everyone knows the secondary precepts. And so something like... Um, Thou shalt, you know, murder is wrong would be like a first precept. Everyone kind of knows that killing someone without a good reason uh, is wrong um, just because of their nature and their mind. But they might not know that um, killing someone of the other tribe ca- counts as, as a someone, right, as murder, Okay. And so that might be an example where, you know, people would dispute um, whether they're culpable for that ignorance or not. Or something like, mm, so Aquinas thinks that marriage um, or the, the, the restriction of sexual relations to marriage is like a primary precept of the natural law. But whether you have 10 wives or one wife is a secondary precept. And so everyone knows the first one, but not everyone knows that you should only have one wife. Um, even though they both belong to the natural law. And so he says, everyone's, um, more or less everyone has a natural knowledge of the, of the first precepts, but not everyone necessarily has a, has a knowledge of the secondary precepts because of how they were brought up or because of the cultural damage of sin or whatever, Okay. With that background, we can do some heavy lifting. You ready? Mm-hmm. This is one of the best articles in the whole Summa Theologiae. Where did it go? 
Okay, I'll find it. It's got to be in my, it's in my browsing history. New Advent, New Advent, Summa Natural Law. Here it is. All right. This is a very cool article. And so the question here is, the stated question is whether the natural law contains several precepts or only one. And in answering it, Thomas gives an account of where the precepts of the natural law come from. Okay? And here's his response to the question. This is kind of tough sledding in this first paragraph, but I think we can handle it. As stated above, I answer that, as stated above, the precepts of the natural law are to the practical reason what the first principles of demonstrations are to the speculative reason, because both are self-evident principles. And so Thomas thinks that we start reasoning with things that are self-evident or just known through themselves. Because if not, where do you start reasoning? If you don't have something that's just fundamentally true in and of itself that you don't have to prove, you can never start proving other things, right? If you didn't have some self-evident first principles from which to start reasoning. Now, a thing is said to be self-evident in two ways. First, in itself. Secondly, in relation to us. Any proposition is said to be self-evident in itself if its predicate is contained in the notion of, its, of the subject. Okay, so he's going to give an example in a second. Like, the, you know, an example would be triangles are three sided, right? That's a self evident statement. If you know what a triangle is, you automatically know that they're three sided, and therefore you know that this connection is true, okay? That proposition is true. Per se notum, right? Through itself. You don't need to go outside or prove it from outside, okay? Any proposition, any proposition is said to be self-evident in itself if its predicate is contained in the notion of the subject. Although to one who knows not the definition of the subject, it happens that such a proposition is not self-evident. So if you didn't know what a triangle was, that wouldn't be self-evident to you, even though it's self-evident in itself. For instance, this proposition, man is a rational being, is in its very nature self-evident, since whoever says man says a rational being. And yet to one who knows not what a man is, this proposition is not self-evident. Hence it is that, as Boethius says, certain axioms or propositions are universally self-evident to all, and such are those propositions whose terms are known to all, as such as every whole is greater than its part, I'm talking physically here, okay? Every whole is greater than its part, and things equal to one and the same are equal to one another. <laughs> I had to, you have to think about that. I, you almost feel like you escape the all people that this is self-evident to when you read these statements. Um, things equal to one and the same thing are equal to one another. That makes sense. But some propositions are self-evident only to the wise who understand the meaning of the terms of such propositions. Thus, to one who understands that an angel is not a body, it is self-evident that, self that an angel is not circumscriptively in a place, but this is not evident to the unlearned for they cannot grasp it. So to understand that an angel is not contained in a room, you have to understand that an angel is immaterial. And that's a hard thing to get because we tend to, we, we're, we, we're um, sentient rational beings. And so when we, when, we, um, when we think about non-spiritual things, we tend to think about them in physical terms. And so you'd have to understand that an angel is not physical, and then you also have to be able to kind of escape your imagination to think that they're not circumscribed by, by space, which is hard to do. Because as soon as I ask you to do it, you start to try to imagine it, and that's the whole point. It's, not, it's unimaginable, because it's not physical. Okay. Whew. Now, a certain order is to be found in those things that are apprehended universally. For that which before anything else falls under apprehension or knowledge is being the notion of which is included in all things whatsoever a man apprehends. And so any notion you have of anything else presupposes existence in some way. Anything you think about has as its primary kind of pre-thought being. 
even things that don't exist, because they exist in your mind at least. And so Aquinas says the first notion that falls that falls into the human intellect, the first conception that we have is of being in general. Something out there is. That's when you actually start thinking. And he does that because he thinks the, the order of our discovery um, maps onto the order of dependence of our thoughts. And so all your thoughts depend on the, on the, all your concepts and thoughts depend on the concept or conception of being. Because if they didn't, they wouldn't exist. Okay. This is complicated. We'll get to good in a second, which is the important part. Wherefore, the first indemonstrable principle, self-evident principle, this is called the principle of non-contradiction, very important if you want to win arguments, is that the same thing cannot be affirmed and denied at the same time. Right? And so if something is true, it's not false. And if it's false, it's not true. Right? The same thing cannot be defer- affirmed and denied at the same time in the same way or the same respect. Right? That's the kind of longer definition, the logical expression. The metaphysical expression, I think, is better. Something cannot both be and not be at the same time in the same respect. Right? The principle of non-contradiction. So if this phone is, if this phone is black... It cannot not be black in the same way that it's black in the same space and at the same time. It might be white later, right? It might be half black and half white, but it's not black and white in the same, in the same way, in the same respect, at the same time. Principle not contradiction. Okay. Now, as being is the first thing that falls under the apprehension, uh, of, of the apprehension simply, or the intellect just considered as a mind, so goodness or good is the first thing that falls under the apprehension of the practical reason, which is the mind directed to action, since every agent acts for an end under the aspect of good. We said that before, right? Every agent or every action is for an end under the aspect of good. What does that mean? It means that the end is good, which means it's desirable. Desirable which means ultimately that it's perfective somehow. It's good for you. It's good for the being that's going after it in some way. It could be pleasant. It could be useful. It could be ultimately good. So anything that you, anything that you act to obtain or do or get is because you think it's desirable and you think somehow it's perfective of your existence or your life in the short term and the long term. Consequently, the first principle of practical reason is one founded on the notion of good. That is, that good is that which all things seek after. All things seek after goodness because goodness is what's desirable and it's desirable because it's perfective of your existence or your experience. Hence, this is the first precept of the natural law. That good is to be done and pursued and evil is to be avoided. If you ever have to give anyone advice, you can always fall back on this. Do good and avoid evil. Okay? Do good and avoid evil. Good is to be done and pursued. Evil is to be avoided. All other precepts of the natural law are based on this, so that whatever the practical reason naturally apprehends as man's good or evil belongs to the precepts of the natural law as something to be done or avoided. Now, here's interesting, right? Is to be... Right, is to be. And so here we have ought. Right, the concept of ought or should. That's different from the that's different from um, the laws of nature as opposed to the natural lo- the natural moral law. Right, the laws of nature you don't say e should equal mc mc squared or force should equal mass times acceleration or gases. I guess they should expand when, right? Uh, no, they do, right? Animals, yeah, that's a little bit different, right? Because there might be more factors that naturally arise, right? Animals should eat when they're hungry. At least they always want to. Um, but they do. Why is this here? Well, because of our freedom and our responsibility, um, this is a this is a um, 
a law, the natural law. I gotta get my, I gotta get my um, what do you call it back? Cursor. My cursor, my cursor disappeared. <laughs> the I got it back. I got it back. Um, right is to be, and so do good and avoid evil is not a dis- simply a descriptive law. It's a proscriptive law, because since we're rational, we're also free. And so the natural law for us, unlike the laws of nature, is moral or ethical. We're responsible for following it, and we have the possibility of not following following it. We merit when we do follow it, and we're rightly blamed when we don't follow it. What makes that possible? Well, see the previous class on the nature of evil or the origin of evil. I don't think I explained it there, but anyway, that's always that's always the old that's the old professor's trick, right? As we saw, when you never really saw it, as we'll see, and then you never see it, right? <laughs> anyway, um, as we saw in last class, wow, when was that? As we'll see in the next class, maybe. Um, right, why it's possible for us not to choose the good and choose the evil is another question, but it's clearly possible. And so it's up to us to follow the, to follow the natural law. Okay. What's the content of the natural law? This is the coolest part of this. We slogged through the first two paragraphs to get to this cool part, okay? Since, however, the good has the nature of an end, and evil the nature of a contrary, hence it is that all those things to which man has a natural inclination are naturally apprehended by reason as being good. So that's kind of cool, right? Like, you know, the law of gravity, this thing just does it, doesn't know it. But all the things that we have a natural inclination to as a good, therefore perfective of us, good for our being in some way, our reason naturally apprehends it as good and therefore naturally desires it and we're morally obliged to foster it. And consequently, it's objects of pursuit and their contraries are evil and objects of avoidance. Wherefore, according to the order of natural inclinations, follows the order of the precepts of the natural law. Because in man, there is first of all an inclination to good in accordance with the nature he has in common with all substances. So this is, the, this is a really cool sentence, right? According to the order of natural inclinations is the order of the precepts of the natural law. And so we go back to the idea of teleology. Right? We go the, back to the idea of nature as being expressive of the proper activities of the thing. And the proper activities of the thing follow... Uh, the proper activities of, of a thing are perfective of the thing because it pursues proper goods. All of that gives rise in us to moral laws. This is, where the, this is what the moral law is. And then he's going to articulate, okay, well, what are the different kinds of natural laws? Well, they come from the different kinds of natural objects of inclination or right, natural desires. So f- on the first level, there is, first of all, an inclination to good in accordance with the nature we have in common with all substances, inasmuch as every substance seeks the preservation of its own being according to its nature. And so Thomas thinks that all things desire to exist, whether they're gases or rocks or trees, they all, as much as possible, tend to keep existing as long as they can. By reason of this inclination, whatever is a means of preserving human life and warding off its obstacles belongs to the natural law. And so um, this is, thou shalt not kill. You shouldn't commit suicide. You shouldn't neglect your health. You shouldn't harm other people's health without a good reason or risk your own health without a proportionate reason. And so all the morality uh, regarding like medicine and um, health and, um, you know, the promotion and defense of life comes from this natural inclination to um, the good of life, right? the good of survival. Secondly, there is man, in man an inclination to things that pertain to him more especially according to the nature which he has in common with other animals. And in virtue of this inclination, those things are said to belong to the natural law which nature has taught to all animals, such as sexual intercourse, the education of offspring, and so forth. And so since we're rational... We're going to get to this in a second. Since we're rational, 
we don't just know we should procreate, we also know that we have to raise children. And raising children, according to the natural law, should be done by, whenever possible, right, uh, by the parents of the child. And so you, you can work backwards from the education of offspring to the natural law mandate of marriage. Um, and so sexual intercourse for a, we'll get into this in, whenever we get to that other class, um, for a rational being has certain laws and restrictions that it doesn't have for other animals. Thirdly, there is in man an inclination to good according to the nature of his reason, which nature is proper to him. Thus man has a natural inclination to know the truth about God, to live in society, and in this respect, whatever pertains to this inclination belongs to the natural law. For instance, to shun ignorance, to avoid offending those among whom he has to live, and other such things regarding the above inclination. Um, and I think that last one is a lot of morality, right? Not lying to each other, being loyal to your friends, right? Not stealing. That we have to live in society and live in families gives rise to a lot of the, a lot of the, um, the particular precepts of, of what we call morality or call the natural law. But the cool thing about this article is that it's a description of the origin the basic origin of all those particular uh, ethical laws. They all come from our inclination to goods that are natural and therefore perfective of us. Um, obviously, the one about God is super important. Okay. Sorry for yelling at you for 10 minutes. Any questions? You got to go. I got to go, too. All right, let's go. We'll have questions next time. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. For further reading, if you'd like to know, this is from question 94, article 2 of the um, Prima Secunda. Yes, the first part of the second part. Prima Secunda. 94.2. If you want to read, read that on your own. I highly recommend it. It's a great read. Page Turner.